Good afternoon and welcome to today's uh, energy seminar. I'm very excited to introduce our speaker for today, uh, who is Dr. Rita Berenwal, who's the Assistant Secretary for the Office of Nuclear Energy in the US Department of Energy. And prior to her current role, she was uh, the Director of the Gateway for Accelerated Innovation uh, in Nuclear, GAIN, uh, at the uh, Idaho National Laboratory, one of the premier uh, nuclear energy research institutions in the world. I have to do a shout out in introducing Dr. Berenwal. I was able to see a small uh, workshop in which he participated through the uh, Schultz Stevenson Task Force at Hoover uh, Institution a few years ago, thanks to David Feder uh, and his team. And I was uh, extremely impressed. So as a, a seminar runner, I said, boy, I wonder if we get this person uh, to talk uh, as authoritatively as she does and as comprehensively and in as balanced a way as Dr. Varenthal um, was able to do on that occasion. Uh, so I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Rita Berenwal and she will, uh, apropos of what I just said, uh, give a very broad uh, update on where we are with nuclear in the US, including what to do about the existing nuclear plants through what's next after that, including uh, technical issues, business issues, uh, international security and global competitive, competitive issues. So with that, uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Rita uh, Berenwald to give us a uh, update on where we are with nuclear in the US and the world. Dr. Berenwald. Great, thank you, uh, John. Can you hear me okay? Yep. All right, very, very good. So uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, and thank you to Stanford University for having me talk about the crucial role of nuclear, not just uh, here in the United States, but around the world. I got into this business almost uh, over just over 20 years ago. I started my career developing advanced fuel for the nuclear Navy for the United States. And um, what um, I had the fortune of was taking a van full of summer interns down to the Newport News shipyard. And uh, we got to go on a field trip. And I didn't realize that that would be a turning point for me and pretty much secure uh, my desire to stay in this industry for my entire career. Um, as we were touring the shipyard, we saw the Ronald Reagan aircraft carrier being constructed. And I was able to stand in the reactor compartment where the reactor would go and realize as I stared several stories up that the fuel that I was working on back in a lab in Pittsburgh was going to be used to power a behemoth of a ship like this around the world and defend our country for years on end safely and securely. And so that's really um, that the energy density of nuclear energy and nuclear fuel is what um, got me and, and kept me in the business. And if we fl fast, flash forward to today, um, I have two teenage children, and it's really important to me that they grow up uh, in a world and inherit a world um, that is um, whose, whose air is cleaner than um, the one that I grew up in. And so I know that nuclear energy will play a very, very vital part uh, in that uh, aspiration for me. And so that's why I stay in this business. And so I want to give you a little bit um, about um, some background on the industry today and then where our office is prioritizing its efforts and where we see the, the industry going. <clears throat> so the United States operates the largest fleet of nuclear reactors in the world. Last year, those reactors generated over 809 billion kilowatt hours of electricity, that's billion as, in, as with a B, as in Bravo. And that's double, one double the production of the next two leading countries combined. Nearly 55% of our country's clean energy comes from nuclear, and nuclear is also responsible for 20% of the electricity that's generated in this country. We have reactors that are operating at full power more than 93% of the time. Uh, that's also called capacity factor. Our nuclear reactors also avoid more than 470 million metric tons of carbon emissions each year. 
And that's the equivalent of removing 100 million cars off of the road. And especially in this pandemic environment where health issues are a topic of daily concern, we must fully appreciate that nuclear reactors keep our air clean by removing thousands of tons of harmful air pollutants each year that contribute to acid rain, smog, lung cancer, and cardiovascular disease. But nuclear is more than just a reliable, clean source of power. There are more than a billion people in, living in the world today that are living in energy poverty, and the majority of them don't have access to clean drinking water. And as energy demands continue to rise around the world, countries are also faced with a challenging task of meeting these needs while lowering emissions at the same time. The thermal energy that's produced by nuclear reactors can also be used to drive manufacturing processes, heat communities, and to purify water. New reactor technologies that are currently under development will bring even more flexibility and access to this incredible power source, more so than ever before. So at DOE, in my office, we're focusing our priorities around four major efforts. One is to sustain that existing fleet that I just mentioned. The next is to get react advanced reactor technologies across the finish line, and that's a top priority of mine. The next one is to establish and maintain a critical fuel cycle infrastructure, and that means making sure that we have uh, addressed all of the fuel, fuel issues starting from cradle to grave. And then the fourth is to enhance our global competitiveness around the world. So despite us coming off of a record year in terms of operation and production with our reactors, our current fleet is, is facing significant challenges due to overregulation, complex market factors, and historically low fuel costs. As a result, very unfortunately, 10 reactors have retired prematurely before the, their license expired since 2013. And an additional five units are slated to retire by 2025. Losing these reactors would ultimately reduce America's large scale supply of affordable, and dependable clean power, as well as the safety expertise, knowledge, and supply chain that goes along with the entire US nuclear industry. The impacts of California's decision to phase out its nuclear power plants prior to their operating licenses ending recently played out in the news. Keeping its San Onofre plant online, which was shut down in 2013, might have prevented some of California's roaring blackouts that, that many of you um, might be experiencing uh, today or over the past several months. California's decision to close Diablo Canyon, its only operating nuclear plant, could lead to future blackouts and a rise in carbon emissions as they transition to other energy sources. The same goes for Illinois, where Exelon recently announced that they were closing their Dresden and Byron power plants, totaling over 4.1 gigawatts of nuclear power. No state in our country should ever have limited supplies of electricity. And with nuclear power, the availability of clean power is never a problem. To help address the challenges that are facing our current fleet, we're supporting the development of new technologies that could help extend the operation of our reactors to 80 years or longer. That means digitizing control rooms from an analog system. And yes, the control rooms for the most part are still generally analog, to developing sensors for online monitoring, to working with industry to develop new fuels that could significantly increase plant performance and reduce operating costs simultaneously. Reducing, regarding advanced fuels for the existing fleet, we're working with industry partners to supply batch reloads of accident tolerant fuel by the mid 2020s. We're also working with a handful of US nuclear plants to demonstrate their ability to produce electricity and hydrogen. And this could open up new market opportunities for the nuclear energy sector. The production of hydrogen can be used regionally to deliver various products ranging from fertilizers and plastics to the development of new synthetic fuel or fuel cells for grid store. DOE is also taking action to support the front end of the fuel cycle. We know that our nuclear fuel production capabilities have taken a severe hit. In 2019, the U.S. produced roughly 174,000 pounds of uranium, and that unfortunately is the lowest annual total in the 70 years of record keeping for this information. A handful of U.S. uranium properties are now, now working at minimal levels to keep their facilities in working order. But unfortunately, many more are not operating at all, waiting for market signals to resume production. 
our nation's only uranium conversion facility is also idle. And all of these front end capabilities of the fuel cycle are at risk of shutting down permanently. In April, the administration's nuclear fuel working group released its report on policy options to restore America's leadership in nuclear energy and technology. Key recommendation in this strategy calls for DOE to establish a uranium reserve to help de-risk our nuclear fuel cycle. Even before the nuclear fuel working group strategy was released, $150 million was included in the president's fiscal year 21 budget request to stand up our uranium reserve. The new stockpile is expected to support the operation of at least two US uranium mines and to reestablish active conversion capabilities. It'll ensure that there's a backup supply of uranium for nuclear power operators in case there's a market disruption. So we look forward to continuing our work with our congressional partners and remain hopeful that the reserve will be funded. We continue to ready ourselves to initiate this very important program. I also wanna highlight important activities in relation to the development of high assay, low enriched uranium or HALU that's going to be needed for many advanced reactor designs. The Department of Energy entered into a contract in May of last year with, with a subsidiary of Centers Energy that will lead to the demonstration of HALU production using US origin technology no later than June of 2022. Many folks understand that the significance of bringing this capability to the market is at a time that's really exciting and new advanced reactor technologies are being developed and demonstrated. Uh, the technology that's used for the demonstration could be a cornerstone for future commercial Haley production that would improve America's energy security. Note that the successful introduction of advanced reactors and the development of a Halu infrastructure provides additional demand for domestic nuclear fuel cycle products and services. The nuclear fuel working group strategy also highlights the vital importance of the Bristol test reactor known as VTR. The U.S. has identified the construction of the VTR as a cornerstone for reviving and expanding our nuclear sector and is one of the highest priorities for the Department of Energy. Once it's completed in 2026, the VTR will support the development of advanced reactor technology and the continued operation of the existing fleet through accelerated testing of new fuels and materials and development of advanced instruments and sensors. Last year, in 2019, the DOE formally established a mission need for the VTR. Further support is shown through the President's Fiscal Year 21 budget request, which asks for $295 million to support the design and construction of the facility. I'm very pleased that last month, the department took the next step with the VTR and formally approved it to move to critical decision one. The Nuclear Fuel Working Group strategy also recommends a continued support for demonstration of U.S. advanced reactor technology. I'm very excited about smaller, more flexible, and scalable reactor designs that can be built in factories. These innovations offer great promise to reduce capital and operating costs, while also increasing revenue generation and more market options. Developing more versatile, smaller reactors for microgrid, remote locations, data centers, Replacement population centers will fundamentally change the way that nuclear energy is used. And I'm also very excited about our new advanced reactor demonstration program. This program focuses DOE and non-federal resources on the actual construction of advanced demonstration reactors that are affordable to build and to operate. A few weeks ago, the department announced that two companies, TerraPower, and X Energy were selected to receive $160 million in initial funding to build two advanced nuclear reactors that can be operational within five to seven years. We're also very strongly supporting the National Reactor Innovation Center to enable these demonstrations and the development of the versatile test reactor to ensure that we in the United States have the infrastructure that's necessary to support the long-term success of US advanced nuclear technologies. In the global marketplace, superior technology though just isn't enough to compete with other countries that can provide comprehensive build, own, and operate packages with attractive financing and fuel kickback options. And that's where we in the United States really need to make more progress. We need to be able to compete with these comprehensive packages. A fully functioning XM bank or export import bank is, is certainly sure to help. 
as will the U.S. Development Finance Corporation, DFC, finally being able to support nuclear energy projects and provide private financing. And these recent changes really will make a difference. And I want to turn for a moment to the topic of recycling used fuel. So I've spent most of my career in uh, nuclear fuel, and it's really astounded me that we take this precious resource and we use it 5%, and then we seem to call it waste. Um, I consider it slightly used fuel. And knowing the difficulty that we have with storage and disposal of this slightly used fuel in our country, um, I feel that there have to be options for dealing with it. Uh, last year, I visited La Hague in France and was very impressed with their recycling operations there. They're recycling 96% of used light water reactor fuel, including the most hazardous isotopes into glass logs, significantly simplifying long-term storage issues. So if we were to adopt this approach in the United States, we know how to provide world-class safeguards and securities to such recycling processes. We should be exploring options to enable and secure the efficient use of nuclear fuel in our advanced reactors in the future. Any national decision on the use of spent fuel should be the product of a robust policy debate, not only among the US government agencies whose interests are implicated, but also the academic and non-governmental sectors, industry and other key stakeholders. Finally, the only way to move forward with this vision of nuclear energy is to address the management of used nuclear fuel. The administration believes that progress on managing the nation's spent fuel in high level ways is crucial and the standstill has gone on too long. Nearly 40 states currently hold nuclear waste but that, that the federal government was required to dispose of beginning over 20 years ago. But both politics but politics have paralyzed Congress from taking any action to fix this, this problem. And so as a result, taxpayers are currently paying hundreds of millions of dollars annually for this lack of progress. And despite Congress's inability to act, this administration is committed to fulfilling the federal government's obligations to properly managing and disposing of the nation's used nuclear fuel and high level waste. And the department will consider permanent disposal of spent nuclear fuel at repository sites other than Yucca Mountain to the extent it's currently allowed by law and other congressional appropriations. The president's FY21 budget prioritizes the research, development, and evaluation of alternative technologies and pathways for storage, transportation, and disposal of the nation's nuclear waste with a focus on solutions that are deployable where there is a willingness to host. And as part of an integrated waste management system, DOE is also considering the temporary storage of spent nuclear fuel. Consolidated interim storage of such used nuclear fuel could be in either a government provided storage facility or a privately owned storage facility. DOE recognizes the full implementation of an integrated waste management system, including a consolidated interim storage program, will really require a change to existing law, and that this effort may need to be adjusted should new regulation new legislation be enacted. And I really applaud the members of Congress that have introduced legislative solutions to advance this policy issue. We very much look forward to working with them and all interested parties as these proposals move through Congress. Finally, I'd like to focus on what we're doing to inspire and prepare the next generation to realize our vision for the future. STEM education is crucially important to ensure that we have the future generation of researchers and scientists to further advance nuclear energy. We also want to engage with those who are crucial members of our STEM adjacent workforce. My office has a vested interest in building a talented, innovative, diverse workforce to support our mission in the nuclear energy space. The complexity of nuclear energy and a broad impact throughout its life cycle necessitates the need to develop, expand, and enhance educational opportunities and scholarships for K through 12 youth related to STEM. We have scholarships and internships that help support students in the post-secondary stage. And we have a concerted effort of foot that engages with the earliest stages of the workforce pipeline, the K through 12 students. We've partnered with the American Nuclear Society and Discovery Education to provide free online standard-based K through 12 uh, learning resources in nuclear energy for all students. The 
program is called Navigating Nuclear, Energizing Our World. We work to design and develop the curriculum that not only introduces the fundamentals of nuclear science to these students, but also engages them in understanding the many applications of nuclear energy, something that has a direct and significant impact on their world. STEM education is especially important in our underrepresented population in STEM fields, including young women, and this is a focus of the U.S. government large and a focus in my office. By encouraging all students to engage in STEM, we can tap into increased multiple perspectives and diverse views to help us find innovative solutions for the energy challenges of today as well as tomorrow. And in conclusion, we are moving forward to ensure that the U.S. regains its nuclear energy leadership, building upon the United States leadership in innovation and advanced technologies. This won't be easy, and it will require a lot of work, especially if we want to achieve these aggressive goals by 2030. I said it's an aggressive goal, and, but, but the issue is that we talk the talk long enough, and it's time to act now. I'm very excited about the future of nuclear energy, and I'm looking forward to our conversation this evening. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Uh, Warrenthal. That was a, a fantastic, uh, short, very succinct, but packed with uh, both uh, detailed information and uh, things you said that normal people could understand. I think that's one of your great talents is to <laughs> be able to understand technical things, which probably a lot of people we know could do, but also to be able to communi communicate them to uh, normal, uh, normal folks like myself in this field. So we do have quite a few questions um, queued up. I'd like to combine them in a way, uh, just because you're probably used to this. So the whole first set uh, you've already touched on in some ways, but I'm going to combine a few themes. And that is uh, how, to, how to get a public perception back on your back on the side of nuclear energy more than it has been. And that would include um, solution. How do you think about solutions to the long uh, long term waste storage problem and the things that probably um, concern the public the most rightly or wrongly, and that is the risk of accident or vulnerability uh, of nuclear fuel and nuclear uh, fuel cycle to terrorist acts. So um, that, that all falls under how can we overcome the issues of public perception, correct? Okay. Yeah, so, yeah I'm, I'm doing it that way. I know there are technical problems, but I'm guessing you're going to say that there are technical problems and you're working on those, but those look easier than the public perception problems. And frankly, I don't think there's a lot of technical problems. What we're doing in yeah. advanced reactor space is using technologies that were invented decades ago and applying all of the uh, new advances that we've had in materials, in corrosion uh, you know, prevention, in uh, robotics and sensors and diagnostics, applying all of those advances to um, nuclear technologies that, that have been around for decades. Um, the, the issue with, with our industry um, for many decades has been this assumption that we need to um, you know, do our work, do it quietly, and stay out of the news. Right. Um, if you don't make the headlines, that's a good thing. That had been the kind of the uh, unspoken assumption for decades. And what we've seen over the past five to ten years, especially, especially with you know, the proliferation of uh, social media, no pun intended, um, is is that we need to be talking about this and what the benefits are. And I don't mean in a scientific way. We think we can do that as well, but. But what resonates with folks is just tell just, and that's why we're doing the K through 12 um, education as well. Just at least mention nuclear energy for more than one sentence in a in a in a curriculum. Not even, they don't even have textbooks anymore, but in a curriculum. Um, and so it's it's about educating folks in that sense, and then talking about you know why we are in this business, why I show up to work every day, what matters to me, just the way I did as I launched this. Right, it was important to me that. Um, nuclear power uh, is used in our aircraft carriers and submarines to defend our country. And it's important to me that uh, I work in an industry that contributes to the health and well being of my family. That's what matters to me. Um, what might resonate to others is that it creates very high paying jobs. It might resonate with folks that um, millions of dollars of tax revenue come into a community that has operating nuclear power plants or that we get to do the geekiest research and development and 
play with the coolest toys, um, you know, that might resonate with them. Or the fact that it produces clean energy, uh, that might resonate with folks. And so if we talk about it more, the way all the other energy forms are talking about themselves, that's going to, to start making a dent. Um, the other thing is that, you know, we, we, we know that utilities and, and plants have marketing and PR departments, and they're working on it as well. But I think um, overall, really, there's been this stigma that had been associated with nuclear. I'm curious to hear from the students, though, because my sense is that that stigma is not um, has not come up through you know the next set of next generation or the next set of, of students, and so we um, need to take advantage of the fact that, that stigma doesn't exist perhaps in this um, you know generation and, and run with that because being in this industry we actually do get to save the world and I know that sounds cliche but that's what we get to do and that's why uh, I'm so thrilled when I get to talk to student audiences and see how much passion there is and how much enthusiasm there is for this industry despite what this kind of overarching um, negative perception might be uh, I think really at the grassroots level it's not there there's a lot more enthusiasm than, than we give folks credit for. Great, yeah, terrific. I'll come back to career advice, which as you guessed uh, is on the student's mind and my mind as well. But I okay. wanna go through a couple, couple more steps. One is, um, uh, it's kind of, I feel like I'm playing a game of whataboutism now. I'm sure you're used to that. That's so right. More on the, uh, I would call it economic life cycle costs, life cycle environmental impacts. I actually got my first energy job from John Holdred, who did a wonderful book early in his career on life cycle impacts uh, and found some disturbing things way back when that I think probably people like you have totally fixed at this point. But uh, on, on the economic side, uh, there are several questions about what is the life cycle cost and what do you predict it's gonna be? Uh, what kind of carbon tax would it take to quote unquote, make nuclear competitive? I know you're probably going to say this is partly related to public perception and how the regulation is done, but that's all part of your job uh, as well. Although you're not the regulatory body, obviously you work very closely with people who do that job. Right. And there are many different organizations that are much better um, uh, versed in, in these topics. So I'm going to talk about what I am familiar with. Um, okay. So I don't get myself into trouble, but also I'm going to caveat it to death because there are so many different reactor sizes and so many different customers that um, if you want to talk about an LCO, we levelized cost of electricity, so that's dollars per megawatt hour. Uh, you also have to understand who that customer is. So when in, in a prior role, um, when I was um, looking at trying to develop an advanced reactor technology, and the price of natural gas was still very low. We put down, we tried to clean sheet it and said, okay, can we develop a concept for $60 a megawatt hour or less is the target um, LCOE price tag. And if we can't, if it can't be at 60 or less, let's not play this game because we will not be able to compete in a cost competitive manner. Now that was for kind of um, competing with existing uh, nuclear power plants in the United States. Here's the thing though, that there are different markets in the United States as well as certainly across the world. So an island or an island or a remote community in the United States is going to have a, possibly a different price point than um, you know, a, a major metropolitan area in the United States. A, a remote area that is trucking in very, very expensive gallons of diesel uh, is looking for something that's going to be cheaper than that, but that might be much higher than $60 a megawatt hour um, as an LCOE target. So we we need to be careful that we're, we, when we talk about that, we're talking about apples to apples. Uh, and then the other piece is that um, you need to also, outside of the United States, balance that with countries. You know, countries are looking to lift their citizens out of energy poverty and get them a good quality of life, something that you know, they can certainly uh, prosper. Uh, you know, uh, in, in that lifestyle. And so um, we start to think about, well, at, at what, you know, what cost is justified to, to bring entire, you know, millions, and, and like talk about that billion uh, number um, for citizens around the world to lift them to that standard of living. Um, it starts to 
once you go outside of the United States, natural gas is not the cheapest energy source. And so nuclear has a different uh, uh, cost uh, competitiveness once we're, we're in, depends on what country you're in. And again, it depends on what reactor product you're talking about. If it's a micro reactor, which is about 20 megawatts or less, um, that might have actually a very specific niche market. Um, the Department of Defense is looking at that type of technology. NASA is looking at that type of technology. There are remote communities that are looking at micro reactors as well. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a different uh, price point for um, different customers, um, different reactor classes. So how's that for skirting the question? Good. I'll, I'll come back. <laughs> I'll come back to the kind of SMR issue in the U.S. in a minute. But yeah, okay, uh, okay. Fa fascinating um, subject that you just started on, uh, which I'd like to get your opinion on, is the whole international issue. As you rightly point out, the uh, perception of nuclear and and the economics could plays out quite differently in different parts of the world. So if you're in a you know subsistence level uh, economy uh, and you're probably willing to uh, figure out how to get the regulations done more quickly and therefore uh, therefore be uh, provide uh, quick uh, cheap energy to millions of people so uh, in that you're in the US of course and probably have a big uh, uh, influence on international things but the question that often comes up is uh, can the US without uh, doing the requisite uh, building of uh, technical capabilities and woman power, uh, can we really play in how the world uh, deals with nuclear safety, trade, proliferation issues, and, and so on? So how do you see the international security dimensions of nuclear? And as you uh, said, it, the international competitiveness uh, issue, issues, how do you think about that set of issues which uh, I think are going to be increasingly dominant as the world moves ahead. And that's a really um, good question. Uh, and we're at a very crucial juncture right now at, uh, at the, you know, in this industry at this point in time, when you look at the worldwide uh, competition. And, and um, we have a very small window, the United States does, in which to continue to lead uh, and exert our technology leadership. Uh, because we have two very fierce competitors out there that are going to overtake us and they will do it uh, brutally and um, it'll be hard for us to recover. And so you talked about, uh, you essentially alluded to our reputation um, and our standard. And so there are uh, many countries out there internationally appreciate that our technology is top notch. There are a few others, you know, countries out there that might have um, nearly as good technology and they, that might be good enough. But what we offer in addition to that top-notch technology is a transparency and a trustworthiness and a promise for a hundred year relationship that our competitors cannot and will not offer. And, and those three intangibles, along with the best technology in the world, are the reason that we continue to um, be the ones that the countries want to come to. Now, here I, I talked about financing and the field take that is, as two areas that we still need to work on. And those are the two reasons that um, countries are, are choosing perhaps not to come with us because we can't offer them and cost is important to them. Um, but once too many countries start to go with our competitors, that's what is at risk. It, our standards that have been, you know, uh, considered a gold standard, um, our, our technology reputation, all of that will start to um, be put by the wayside and then prolifer proliferation um, and, and those concerns will take a, a, a front seat, will come to the front burner, so to speak. Uh, and, and that's part of the reason why we must continue to not only offer um, technology that's top notch and other options like you'll take that. But then we also provide um, workforce development, um, um, capacity building. So not only um, human resource development, but also uh, guidance with their infrastructure development for countries that um, either ha have never had nuclear or want to expand their existing um, footprint, for example. And then also uh, 
collaboration with the respective regulatory bodies. So the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission here in the United States is considered the gold standard. Uh, and so to be able to share lessons learned, best practices with up and coming regulatory bodies is also very, very important to us um, from a national security standpoint. Sorry to jump around so much, but back to the uh, microgrids and uh, new tech, maybe small modular reactors. There's several questions on what kind of oversight and monitoring do you believe is required to uh, uh, bring those technologies to fruition, or, or I should say large scale uh, market and public acceptance here in the US? So um, all of those reactors, if they're going to be deployed um, and, and produce electricity commercially here in the United States, have to be, uh, those designs have to be certified by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And that's our regulatory body in the United States. Um, and there, the NRC is an independent agency whose first and foremost priority is to ensure the public's safety and, and well-being. And so that's the lens through which they do all of their work. And um, so that's, that gets to the beginning of your question about monitoring. Um, so one, it has to be a license designed by the NRC, but then in um, existing plants, on, uh, in our current fleet today, there are on-site resident inspectors from the NRC. And so while I don't know if such a, a position would be necessary for the smaller, like the SMRs, or the, certainly probably not for the micro reactors, there will be that type of oversight I would envision um, for these newer um, reactor types and, and classes. Um, it's what's expected today, and uh, we would have to prove um, substantially um, why those positions wouldn't be needed for other reactor designs. And, and the NRC, by the way, is receptive and is willing to listen and adapt its policy, it, its um, regulations and um, criteria, but a lot of data and a lot of, uh, I would say, experimental data as well as modeling and simulation data um, needs to support those um, kind of positions as, as you go into the NRC. Great. Uh, now back to economics, we still have a lot of questions by people who favor, say, uh, renewable energy. Uh, and those are, why not just use renewable energy? Why not use natural gas as a grid stability baseload power source? I'm sure you you get these questions all the time, uh, but I think on behalf of the audience, it would be good to hear your perspe perspective on that. In many ways, you've answered this in bits and pieces, but if I ask that, Question on behalf of the audience directly. How how would you respond? Sure. So um, let, let's talk about the clean energy uh, umbrella. Under that umbrella, uh, I consider nuclear, I consider wind, I consider solar, and I consider hydro. Um, the question that you just asked was why not couple renewable with natural gas? Uh, correct. So yes. you just offset the benefits that you just got from whatever renewable source that you were operating, be it uh, wind, solar, or, or hydro. Um, to me, that to, it doesn't make sense. Um, albeit natural gas currently does have a low price tag in the United States. But, but if you're trying to um, implement renewable sources, I, I trust that you're trying to, to minimize the carbon footprint, minimize carbon emissions, uh, maybe meet a state, state mandate or, you know, if you're outside of the U.S. national mandate, um, it, you're, you're not playing with the right pieces there if that's the part of it. I'm not saying natural gas shouldn't be part of it. It can be, but, but nuclear would be much more beneficial if you're trying to meet clean energy part of it. Um, also, uh, renewables take up a lot of, in, in the case of windmills, a lot of um, land. Um, and solar, uh, and I know you all know this, um, operates at, at, at its peak during certain parts of the day. And so to be able to supplement those off hours with nuclear reliable base load generation um, energy source um, does make a lot of good sense to me. Great, and then uh, uh, you almost start, touched on this, but again, to be more explicit, there, I got a couple we got a couple of questions on uh, timing. So, uh, Given your own personal uh, 
uh, forecast for when the new, more safer systems are available? Do you worry there'll be a big gap between, you know, reliance on existing power plants and the introduction of uh, new ones? Uh, actually, no. I think there will be substantial. There, there will be enough time to have substantial overlap. We have plants. Some are closing 20 years prematurely because of economic conditions. It has nothing to do with the performance or the technical features of, of the reactor. Those are just fine. It has to do, the reason some of these plants are closing prematurely um, are economic reasons. So there will be, assuming these continue to their, the adhesive plate continues to their 80 or plus year lifetime, there will be plenty of time to overlap, to supplement, um, and we're talking just about the United States. When you look outside the United States, the market is, is very large. Um, there is plenty of opportunity. By the way, there are dozens of developers just in the United States alone on advanced reactor technologies. And we tell audiences all the time, there's plenty of space for all of them to be playing in this arena um, because there's so much opportunity. Not only, I mean, in the United States, there's opportunity, but there's so much more globally um, and so much more need as well that, um, there's, there's plenty of um, customers to go around, so to speak. Yeah, as, uh, as uh, we saw in the uh, Hoover session and elsewhere out here in Silicon Valley, there actually is quite a, a big uh, pickup of entrepreneurs in the, on the nuclear side. Unfortunately, those so far haven't gotten as much publicity perhaps as some of the other fields. So I, I understand that even at that level, uh, it, it's kind of an issue. So I have a, a uh, another question from a couple of colleagues. I think it's on the international um, nuclear front, and that is who are the competitors? I know there was quite a bit of consternation a while back uh, that South Korea and other Asian companies had gotten big contracts in the Middle East, a rather sensitive geopolitical area. So who do you think the big competitors are now to U U.S. dominance in, in the international nuclear um, industry and, and issues, policy issues related, foreign policy issues, if you will, related to that. So um, our, our two biggest competitors that we view um, for this industry, again, representing uh, the U.S., uh, are China and Russia. And so um, you know, there are potentially um, geopolitical ties when, when offers are made from our competitor. And so that to, to us is, is concerning. Um, if that's indeed true. And so uh, for all the reasons that I mentioned, not only the top-notch technology, but you know, the, the hundred year relationship that we would embark on with countries, not, it would not be just transactional. Um, the transparency that we have with not only um, the government itself, but the, the regulator. Um, and then the fact that we will assist with their capacity building in terms of human resource, uh, training and growth, um, learning opportunities, and then also infrastructure um, assistance that they might might be. I'm not saying that they would, but for either of those cases in terms of capacity building. But um, we offer those resources if, if needed um, to to entities that that would want it. Great. One one big final question. You talked about this before, but just to get a little bit more uh, up close and personal, I know you're going to meet with some. Um, uh, a very uh, inquisitive students in a little bit. Um, what, uh, so I'll tell it this way, it's a personal story. So when I was young, uh, a kid, uh, there was a board game called Careers, which still may exist, I'm not sure. And uh, I was headed towards uh, aeronautical engineering and astronautics, and that was the number two highest value career. And you probably can guess uh, with your background what the number one career was. and the major that my college roommate pursued was nuclear engineering. So what happened to that and how can we uh, get, uh, you did probably intrigue some people because I do believe that these jobs in the nuclear space are pretty high paying jobs because you want really responsible people. So what advice can you give the uh, mi middle age, but also a lot of the students that are uh, listening out of our three or so hundred people on this uh, webinar regarding that? So. Um I would, I would say that in our industry, we have such a wide um, variety of folks from different backgrounds and, and frankly, diverse experiences that if you, just because you're, you haven't majored in you know, nuclear science or nuclear engineering, um, that's fine. 
um, all of my degrees are in material science and engineering. Um, and, and I work with folks that um, are physicists and uh, mechanical engineers, chemical engineers, um, English majors, art history majors. Uh, so it takes, you know, I, I, it takes a wide variety of, of experiences and perspectives to be, uh, to make to make it a successful organization, um, you know, in this industry. And so, if your passions are around, um, you know, being creative in the science space, uh, being part of a clean energy uh, industry, um, and yeah, the, the pay uh, in these jobs is good. But it also it's not just um, the four year, the master's or the PhD degree. We're talking also out of high school. There's, there are vocations that uh, are desperately needed in this industry where um, trades, and if you have that trade, um, you, you can pretty much write your own ticket. Uh, welders, um, other crafts folks, the, the boom that we're seeing with uh, construction of new plants down in Georgia, not the boom, but the, the construction that we're seeing down in uh, Georgia, um, those, those crafts people, are um, a hot commodity, so to speak. And we're, we're trying to plan, like if there are going to be new builds around the country, we're anticipating that those crews are actually gonna be the same ones that are gonna be building the next set of new reactors. And oh my goodness, who's gonna, who's gonna come in after, after them? And so there are a lot more opportunities out there than there are um, humans at the moment to fill those slots. So we've got folks um, straight out of uh, high school that, that can certainly land up folks that uh, might have completed a two-year degree, like an associate's degree, um, that uh, have plenty of opportunities in this industry. And then all the way through, um, you know, full through bachelor's, master's, and, and PhDs. Um, that said, um, the, the path that I have taken was not one that I had ever envisioned for myself. So my advice to, to the students and, and others that, that care to listen would be, um, Keep, keep your eyes open, listen to um, folks that, that come to you, you know, with suggestions like this opportunity might be good for you. They might tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, look over here and maybe consider this opportunity. Um, I, am, I have always been so pleasantly surprised at the handful of opportunities that I've had where folks have said, I want you to try this. I think you'd be good at it. Um, or I want you to do this because you aren't a nuclear engineer. And I want to understand what your perspective would be if you leave these 200 people uh, in this organization, because I think you would do it differently and that's what we need right now. So um, listen to, to those folks. They may not necessarily be a formal mentor by any means, but um, folks that, that you surround yourselves with um, that, that come and, and offer you um, a suggested opportunity, always at least consider it. Even if you don't think you're ready for it yet or you're not the right fit for it yet, listen to those other voices too. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Uh, I would say out of the many audiences for this seminar series, probably the highest priority one for those of us involved uh, putting it on are the students, the youngsters coming up through the system. So thank you very much, Dr. Berenwal, for such a thoughtful and inspirational seminar on a tough subject, and that is the uh, future of nuclear in the US and around the world. So I think it's time to move on to the next uh, phase where you'll get to talk a little bit more up clo close and personal with a select group of uh, very bright uh, young students. So thank you once again for your wonderful uh, seminar. We'll look for you down the road. Hopefully you'll get to come visit uh, when we're allowed to travel again. We'd love to see you here for wherever you might want to be coming from at that point. All right, I'm happy to visit. Great, great. thank you. Thank you. You're on. Uh,